Welcome back to another episode. It's 2023. Happy New Year's. And I'm more than happy to start off this year with this episode because it's about you and I. It's about you and your neighbor. It's about me and mine. It's about us. Building a healthy community. Now, what does that mean? Making a delicious pot of soup requires huh, vision. It requires plenty of ingredients. You definitely need to have some confidence. And the last ingredient that you definitely need is some love. And without those things, that soup, I don't know if anybody's ever going to enjoy it. And I like to start with that because building a healthy community is very similar to making soup that, you know, revives the soul. It brings all, right? It brings all the pieces together. All the individuals, all the ingredients are the recipes, right? The seasonings, the spices, the flavors, right? Into that one pot. But guess what? It all begins with one person. The one person who has a vision to say, I want to make soup. The one person with the confidence and the ambition to say, you know what? These are the things that I need. The one person who does not have an ego to say, hey, I need your help because you are a farmer and you have this. You um, have this ingredient and I need that. Do you want to contribute to this soup? Because at the end of it, guess what? You get a bowl. He gets a bowl, she gets a bowl, everyone gets a bowl of soup, which then means our souls, our bodies are replenished, we feel healthier, and we are able to thrive. And guess what? We can continue to make more pots of soup. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Right? And I do hope this episode inspires you to lay the first brick of your healthy community. That's what I'm hoping for with this episode here, that I can spark something in somebody, right? And that person could be you. That you can be the one to have the vision to say, you know what, I want to make some soup. And who are the people? What are the ingredients that I'm going to need for this soup to be spectacular? And this, this hit me because, rightfully so, it's a new year. And... It only makes sense that I launch it with this because it's missing. That community setting is missing. Um, because lately, I've noticed communities, as I have come to know them, are a thing of the past. Right? Communities, like I've known them my whole life, are extinct in the 21st century. No longer are communities physical spaces with, you know, actual human beings traveling, walking through, saying hello, greeting each other, checking in on each other, knowing your neighbor, right? They have transitioned to these online communities, which are literally virtual. That means you can't touch them. You don't know who your neighbor is. You are communicating with avatars, which is just a still image. Right. And the disturbing truth is this generation of young people weren't privileged to those communities that I know it or some of you are familiar with because you grew up in them. In fact, this generation is stripped of the opportunity to grow up in a community, you know, and they've been handed a virtual one instead. One they can't touch. One they can't feel. One that they often can't really see in front of them. Not on the screen, but physically in front of them. And, and what those members of that community look like. One that they cannot smell. They can't taste the creations, right? The soup that these communities make. And they can't hear the true voices of that community. 
This is a problem. This is a major problem. And if you don't think it's a problem, feel free to make sure you share your thoughts in the comments. I'd love to hear a different perspective than the one I just shared. And while we're here, please make sure you subscribe, like, give a thumbs up, uh, follow the show if you're listening to it on Podbean or any other platform that you listen to your podcast on. And I would love it if you actually engage, share with family members, right? Intrigue somebody else with this conversation. If you're watching this on YouTube, don't forget to hit the bell so you'll be notified on any uh, new episodes that drop, right? It's 2023. It doesn't cost you anything. I just need your support to grow this channel and this show so that we can reach more ears that are willing to listen and are going to benefit from it so we can mold our future together. Okay, so let's get back into it. Um, I'm going to use this episode to share with this generation as well as the old and the future what it takes to establish a community that works. Right. Similar to the ones in the past, they worked. Communities in past worked. Otherwise, you and I wouldn't be here having this conversation. Right. Because if they had failed me, I wouldn't be here. If they had failed you, you wouldn't be here listening. OK, so there are some benefits but I want to share with you what I think is going to help establish a healthy community. Right now. <clears throat> In order to establish a healthy community, what's required of us is effort. Every member in there needs to give it effort, a good amount of effort. Um, we also need a commitment from the individuals within that community. The organizations, the entrepreneurs, whether small or large organizations, the nonprofits, every organization Right. We need a commitment from them as well as local governments. I know. I know. I'm not trying to get political, but this is a fact. And when I say local governments, that means policing and every other agency that's connected to the government, social services and all of that stuff. But ultimately, our MPs. Right. Um, we need to know who they are and establish a rapport with them. I believe I spoke about this um, very, very early on in the show about, um, you know, economics and, and poweronomics, right? So you can check those episodes out uh, and just kind of get a concept, a context to what it is I'm alluding to when I say local governments. There are steps that we can take to accomplish this outcome, okay? So let's get into that. I think it's critical to identify the needs and the goals of the community, right? But on top of that, we need to also understand the community in, in order to develop effective strategies and initiatives to support those strategies. This can involve conducting surveys, right? Focus groups and community meetings to gather input from residents and people that live there. We want to know what it is, um, you know, that we're going through on a day-to-day -day basis, who's experiencing what. And how is it impacting them and, and how are they contributing to the, um, you know, overall uh, ecosystem so that we can actually provide resources. Now, that's where the benefit of a focus group meetings, right, and the surveys are for. And I think we have to be transparent when you're doing that. It can't just be one organization conducting it. And then that way, it seems like that organization is trying to just benefit from the information they gather. But it's got to be a community um, whether, you know, a committee that's set up that every member of the community, as far as the business, uh, the government um, and residents are all represented on that board or or something of that nature. Right. So every voice is heard. But again, the community has to de decide and select those individuals who represent them on that board. OK, now, once we've identified the needs and goals of the community. Right. It's important to develop a plan that outlines specific actions and strategies to address these needs and achieve those goals. That's critical. I think one of the hardest things I've always experienced or witnessed is 
the actionable steps, the stages where we get, we can plan, we can strategize, we can have all the theory in the world and all the flip chart papers with the ideas. But once it's time to take action and actually move forward is where a lot of us fall short, community building and things of like that, even organizations fall short, right? Because that's the part that we can't see. And it takes a visionary to really see it and, and create that navigational system for us to follow. Right. And that's where leadership comes in. OK, this plan should be developed in you know collaboration with community members and should be based on the input and feedback that we get from those focus groups and the surveys. It only makes sense. Right. It's also essential to engage and empower the members and this is this is key like empowering somebody to believe they actually have a voice and they have an influence on a global i mean you know, within the economy obviously within the, the 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 community is what i mean um to have that impact or that influence is crucial like that empowerment that level of empowerment it just puts them through the roof, which means they want to do more for the community, which means they want to contribute a lot more than they initially have thought they were going to, you know, um, be required to contribute. They will go above and beyond, okay? Which means that we have to involve them in the planning, right? The implementation process of the initiatives and programs. Give them a reason to be invested by allowing them to invest, Right? And I think those are the things that we need to consider when we're thinking about these things. Okay. Now, this can also involve creating opportunities for community members to participate in decision making, right? Actual decision making, not fluff. Providing resources and support for them to take on leadership roles within that, that community. Okay. So we have to now trust each other, right? We have to trust that the other person we've, uh, you know, appointed in this role is going to have everyone's best interests, right, at heart when they decide on things. I think another key thing is establishing, you know, a partnership, uh, collaborations with organizations, businesses, uh, and government agencies that can help leverage resources, expertise, and can also increase the impact of community initiatives. So I'll give you an example of that. You might have a photographer. A lot of us don't value photographers, but they are no different than griots from, you know, um, older African cultures and traditions. Right. A griot was somebody who recorded information the stories of, of a community or a village or a town so that the history is documented. That's essentially a photographer. They capture every moment throughout the stage. Someone who makes film, someone who's an artist, painting or telling the stories, it could be a storyteller, uh, someone who writes books. Um, and the reason why I'm stressing the arts is because often the arts are the ones that people neglect as if it doesn't have any purpose. But without art, none of our stories would ever be available for others to read. The books that we write, the pictures that we look at, the, the novels and the graphic novels and all these paintings that we so value today is art. Everything around you is art. Again, don't let me go on this tangent because I know I can get lost in there. I'm passionate when it comes to arts because I am an artist and I value what art brings to our existence. So... That's why I want to focus on the arts with that little stretch there. OK, but allow these individuals to leverage their resources, their expertise, tap into that. Right. So that we can, you know, have an impact, a greater impact on the initiatives that we create in, in the communities that we all have to, you know, appreciate and enjoy. Now, finally, it's important to regularly monitor, right? You want to keep an eye on things and where we are, evaluate the progress of the community initiatives and, and make adjustments, right? It's not once you start it, that's it. It's, it's set. It doesn't need any fine tuning. No, you need to frequently make adjustments because the, you know, the community and the initiatives are constantly evolving. People are evolving. We're changing. 
We have new interests, new challenges, new obstacles, right? New ideas. So let's infuse all those things. And that's why we need to make constant adjustments, right? Based on the results, we make an adjustment. This can involve conducting surveys again, right? New surveys, new focus groups, analyzing the data and the metrics to measure the effectiveness of the programs and initiatives, right? Essentially, we either evolve or we die. We choose to learn a new skill or we're going to be used until, you know, we perish. So we need each other. Now, establishing a healthy community community requires a proactive approach. It also requires a collaborative approach, right? One that involves the participation and engagement of everybody in that community. And this is what's critical. We need to acknowledge that. <sighs> Something else that I'm noticing over the time, over the years. In the name of uh, gentrification and, and so forth. We also have cultural appropriation. That's a big thing. Okay. Is value. The value of a community cannot be measured. It cannot be me measured. Right. But somehow we've allowed the, the ego of man and politicians to place limits, right, on these values that communities have uh, to offer. Various communities across any metropolitan area you can see, right, is being gentrified. Small pockets of communities have been gentrified. Large pockets have been gentrified. Why? Because those with the power do not understand or appreciate those communities, right? And the value that they bring. A community can be incredibly important to a person for many reasons. It can provide a sense of belonging, support, and connection with others who share similar experiences. Oftentimes, similar cultures and backgrounds, right? A community can also provide access to resources, opportunities, and obviously social networks that can be beneficial for personal and or professional growth, right? Being a part of a community can help individuals feel less isolated and alone, and it can also provide a sense of security as well as safety. So these are the values that we all experience in one community and another, right? Whether you're a politician, whether you live in um, suburbia, whether you live in the urban city or metropolitan, whether you live in the, in the ghetto, we all have these experiences, right? The only difference is if I live in suburbia, I might have a different perspective on those who live in the, in the ghettos. Why? Because of the stories that are being told about the ghettos. And the opposite is also true. Those living in the ghettos have a different story that's being told about those who live in suburbia. So both parties are being sold a different narrative. Now we have a conflict, a misunderstanding, a disagreement, right? Now what that has done is shifted the value scale. So those in the, in the ghettos believe that if I live in the suburbia, there's more value to me as a person living in such a community. And those in suburbia are looking at those in the ghetto and saying, ooh, if I live there, oh, my value is next to nothing because they have a lot of drugs, they have a lot of violence, they have a lot of this. Right? So now me from suburb suburbia looking down at those in the, in the ghettos I'm going to support any company or government that says, hey, let's tear it down and rebuild it so we can have a, another suburbia because that would be better for everybody. Here I am speaking for everyone else, not those who are currently living there, right? That's basically gentrification, right? Uproot those people because we don't see the value in them and their community and what they bring to the, the larger society. So it's okay. We can justify that. 
but not those living in suburbia, right? And this is where the disconnect comes in, okay? Um, it can also foster, I'm talking about communities here, right? Uh, foster a sense of empowerment, right? And agency uh, as individuals can come together, affect change, and make a positive impact on their community. This happens in the ghetto and in suburbia, right? It just looks different when you're standing on the outside of either of those communities looking onto the other. Okay? But what we need to understand is that community holds the key to ending despair, poverty, violence within itself. It really does. If that group of people come together and say, you know what? We won't stand for that. The 0.0001 percentile that's committing these offenses can easily be rooted out of that community. But in order for that to happen, the greater percentile of those people need to be the ones to speak up and stand up against that and evoke that change, right? Research has shown that being a part of a strong and supportive community can have numerous positive effects, not only on your mental health, but your physical health, right? It reduces stress levels and also improve your overall well-being. That's common sense, though, I would think. If I live in a place where I don't see violence, I'm able to walk my dog, leave my door open, and don't feel any form of threat could ever come to me, that is less stress. My overall well-being will be improved, right? I'm going to be a better, much better person. I can concentrate mentally, physically, and everything else. Now flip the tables. And if you're living in a place that is crime infested, drug infested, and so forth, your mental and your physical health cannot be reduced. Your stress level cannot be reduced because you don't know if you're going to make it back home when you leave your house. You don't know if, you're, if you go to work or you're going to make it back home home safely you don't know when your next meal is coming from because your job is not stable right so all these things play a role so you need to you need to be aware of that and it's just research right that kind of points out all these um, facts um, because you know someone will help you in the time of need you're going to return that gesture to someone else in need in order for all members to thrive and succeed in such communities that are healthy. Okay? So we need to be aware of that. Each one teach one. That's where that comes from. Right? I help you. You help me. I feed you. You can feed me. Right? We barter. Right? We help out each other. So no one starves. And everyone thrives. What makes a community strong? And what makes a strong community are two different questions. But it's one to consider, right? One to think about. So what makes a strong community or what makes a community strong? They go hand in hand, right? And I thought about it. And, in, and, and did a small research, which basically means Googled, right? I Googled a few things and, and whatnot. And I found that there are several key components that can contribute to the strength of a community. However you want to de define strength, it's up to you, but I'm just going to share with you what I discovered. I think that would be interesting. Okay? A shared sense of identity and purpose can provide a sense of belonging and connection among community members, and it can help create a sense of unity and common understanding. Okay? Effective communication and collaboration can help to foster trust, understanding among community members, and can also enable them to work together towards a common goal. Having access to resources and opportunities can also help support the growth and the development of community members. It can provide the necessary tools and support for individuals to achieve their goals. Supportive relationships and healthy social networks, right, can also help create a sense of connection and support among those members in that community. And it can provide a network of individuals who can offer assistance and or guidance. 
for the community. Inclusive and equitable practices can help to ensure that all members of the community are treated fairly with respect and that everyone has the opportunity to participate and contribute to the community's needs. But in order for all those things to take place, we also must understand that strong communities are ones that are able to effectively support and empower their members. They're also able to provide necessary resources and opportunities for individuals to thrive. When one wins, it's a win for the community at large. Now, how do we go about supporting one another? Because support is different for everyone. And everyone's needs, you know, are different, which means this is something that we need to recognize. Respect the person you're giving support to, right, by asking them how you can best support them and respecting their decision. That's the harder part, right? This will end, you know, is very difficult for many of you to digest as a concept, but it is necessary. Think about that. Respect the person you're giving support to by asking them how you can best support them and respecting the decision that they make. Right? So I've been in a situation where a homeless individual asked, you know, for help. And their sign said, I need f food, I'm hungry. This is way back when. And I went ahead and bought them food, a few burgers. There was a McDonald's around the corner. But they didn't appreciate it. They didn't want it. They actually, in fact, swore at me and cussed me and was very disrespectful and threw away the food that I had bought them. After I had bought the food, they said, why don't you just give me the money instead? Then it dawned on me. I didn't ask them how I could you know, be of service to them. I just read the sign and jumped to my conclusion. So even though, you know, his sign was misleading, he could have just said, oh, I need money. That's fine. That's one thing. You know what I mean? But it happened. That's just a small example that I can share with you right now about, you know, not asking that person or respecting their decision. Now, too often, we allow our pride and ego to mislead us into making poor decisions or jump into really bad assumptions. When a member of a community is mourning the loss of a loved one, it's important for the community to offer support and comfort in a sensitive and compassionate way. I recently went through a loss myself, and um, I believe in... My previous episode, I shared that with you guys. You know, and I've had some communications with people in my community that were not compassionate and were not sensitive. Now, in their defense, they also didn't know I was going through that situation. They didn't know I was mourning. But the mere fact that they didn't even check in to see how I was doing but responded or communicated with me with such aggression that I thought was offensive, rude, which pushed me in a situation where I had to respond in a way that I wasn't comfortable doing, but felt was necessary for me to respond in order for that person to acknowledge their part in this ordeal. Long story short, they did apologize, which I was grateful for, but... Because of the individual and, you know, the level of respect that I had for them, I expected more. Again, this falls back on me because it was my expectation of them, right? So they fell short. But again, this is just another example of us not being sensitive and compassionate to our, towards those that we um, deem strong, Right, and I've also had another episode where I talk about checking in on your strong friends. So it's important that we do that. It's imperative that we do it. Now, here are some suggestions for how you know a community can support a member who is grieving. 
Providing emotional support can include offering, you know, words of comfort and condolences, providing a listening ear for the person to talk about their feelings and their experiences. Offering practical assistance can include providing help with tasks such as running errands for them, cooking meals, or providing some form of transportation if that's what they require. Okay? It's important to recognize that everyone grieves in their own way and at their own pace. And <clears throat> this is something that I've been learning over the years, is that we all grieve differently and at our own pace. And it wasn't until recently that I really and truly appreciated that. Because I knew of the loss that I had gone through, that I had experienced. It didn't actually hit me. I didn't grieve until the viewing. And that's when I fell apart. But I felt comfortable falling apart because I knew it was going to happen at some point. I just didn't know when. And I wasn't sure if my body and my mind was protecting me from that, um, that experience. But in that moment, I... My mind couldn't do anything. It couldn't prevent the tears from falling. It couldn't prevent uh, the emotion from showing. It couldn't prevent any of that. It couldn't prevent, you know, having my brother um, console me, and my sister, you know, hug me because they saw me in the state that they probably never witnessed before, you know? So it's crucial to be understanding and patient with people. And, you know, to allow the person the time and space they need to process their circumstances and the emotions that come with those circumstances. I think it's also important to provide resources and information that can include providing information about grief and coping resources. Um, maybe provide some support um, hotlines, numbers, right? Support groups or counseling services that are available to such individuals is, is, is important. Remembering the person who has passed away, right, can be helpful for the community to remember and honor that person who has passed away and offer support to the grieving individuals, right, in doing so. I think this can also include organizing a memorial service or creating a memorial in their honor, right? It's important for a community to offer support and compassion to members who are grieving but also provide necessary resources, right, to help them get through this difficult time. Now, throughout this episode, I hope I was able to display to you the many ways a healthy community helps everyone in that community and how every member is important to the other. And the resources and the partnerships that need to be established for that community and its members to continue to thrive. It's a huge practical and kinesthetic difference between an online community and the proven asphalt communities I grew up in, that some of you grew up in. I learned from the members of my community and their experiences because I had an eyewitness exposure to the consequences of their choices and lack thereof. So I knew how to move accordingly. I can't say the same for those who are living in an online community. Right? Those that live in a virtual community because everyone is faking it and presenting false lifestyles through the lens of a camera. So the truth is extremely skewed, distorted, or non-existent. But what this tells me is these individuals don't actually see themselves or the actual life they're living because they're too busy trying to convince me to believe them. Until next time, until next episode, love, peace, and nappiness.